Okay, this is section two of our first chapter of the World War One notes. Um, this one, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the United States starting to get involved in, in what becomes World War II, but um, we will not make it to Pearl Harbor in this one. That'll be in the next um, section, if I remember correctly. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, if you remember last time, I left off in section one talking about uh, Japan invading China and, and the violence they committed there in China and atrocities and, and news of that carried around the world and um, Japan attacked without a declaration of war, which is something we'll see again, um, and used tactics that were, were truly cruel. There's really no getting around around that, obviously. Along with the hundreds of thousands of Chinese citizens, the, the Japanese had also killed three U.S. soldiers when they sank uh, the Panay, uh, which is the U.S. gunboat on the, that was on the Chang River. President Franklin D. Roosevelt criticized these Japanese acts of aggression in a speech that he was making in Chicago in 1937. He, he said their, quote, reign of terror and international lawlessness, uh, bombing of civilian cities, and acts of unspeakable cruelty and violence. He also noted that no part of the world was truly isolated from the rest. He, he knew that the United States wanted to be isolated right now, <clears throat> but this is kind of his chance to sort of warn the American people of what's probably going to come unless something truly drastic happens and the war that's beginning stops. Um, I think he's trying to prepare the United States to, to probably get into another war. Um, and kind of prepare them for that. Roosevelt's solution was an informal alliance um, with, with other peace-promoting countries, but he did not give specifics on actions to those in the alliance should take. Uh, his speech was widely criticized. FDR put his beliefs that the United States should be willing to get involved on the back burner for now. <clears throat> Eventually we will have to get involved, but I think he was a little, probably more willing in, in 1937 than others in the country were. Hitler launched, um, this is, this is really the beginning, the official beginning of what we're calling World War II, and you'll see why here in a minute. In spring of 1938, uh, we also left off with Hitler, you know, being appeased once again by the British and the French, um, saying, okay, you can have this last little piece of, of Czechoslovakia, and then you have to promise, um, not to take any more land, we call that the Munich Pact. He kept his promise for 11 months, and then he broke the pact and took the rest of Czechoslovakia into his empire, into the Reich. Russian and French leaders are now forced to acknowledge that physical action is going to have to be taken in order to actually stop Hitler, and that appeasement is not going to work. Realizing his next move will be against Poland, uh, the British and the French sign an alliance with Poland to guarantee help to them if and when Hitler attacks. However, Hitler was primarily concerned about a war with the Soviet Union, or the USSR. He didn't want to fight a two-front war. The irony here is that he does end up fighting a two-front war, and it's 100% his decision to start it, but we'll get to that later. Um, so he signed something called the, no the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact with Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union in August of 1939 promised publicly not to attack one another. Secretly, they agreed to invade and divide Poland. Hitler was going to go first, and then the Soviet Union would take some of the eastern part of, of Poland when, when the Nazis had taken what they wanted. Um, this agreement shocked the world, and it guaranteed that Poland was going to be invaded, and they were. Um, September 1st, the German blitzkrieg hits Poland from three different directions. Uh, about two weeks later, the Soviet Union invaded from the east, and Poland had fallen completely by the end of September. So this is the, the true beginning of World War II. Um, Europe was at war, just as it had been 21 years earlier. The Axis powers eventually included Germany, Italy, Japan, and some other small countries. The Allies included Britain, France, eventually the United States, the Soviet Union, <clears throat> which might surprise you, because we just talked about this agreement that Hitler made with the Soviet Union, but um, something's going to happen where they will switch switch sides officially. Um, the Soviet Union, China, and some other small countries. After the takeover of Poland, 
the war entered an eight-month period of calmness. We call this the phony war, eight-month period where nothing really seems to be happening. And then in the spring of 1940, with the non-aggression pact signed with the Soviet Union, Hitler decides to send his army west. In Germany, or sorry, excuse me, in April of 1940, Germany attacks Denmark and Norway. Both fell almost immediately. In May, he sent Blitzkrieg forces into the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. He's getting very close, in case you don't have a map of Europe in your head, and I've got a map on the next slide, to France. All right, France. <laughs> Hitler's next target going to be France. After World War One, the French constructed something called the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line is a large chain of fortifications. It's 943 miles long. It's not a solid 943 mile, mile long wall or anything, but it is a line of tank traps, forts. There are some portions that are kind of like a wall. It's meant to be a deterrent, to, to make it very clear that the Germans could not come across the border into France like had happened in World War One. And had World War Two been fought exactly like World War One, this would have been brilliant. But, you know, the French failed to take into consideration military technology like, you know, the improvement to tanks and, you know, airplanes. Um, other big military vehicles. Uh, yeah, so along with that, French thought that this line would be impenetrable. Um, they, they thought that they could not get through the Ardennes Forest, uh, and that's kind of the place that they left the most open, I guess, for Hitler to evade through, just because they didn't think he could get through there. Um, and Hitler did go right through the Ardennes Forest, right around the Maginot Line. You can see it. In the, in the picture I've got for you on the right, uh, the book screen tactics worked again. French had not considered, like I mentioned, the evolution of warfare, um, improvement to tanks, airplanes, different things. Uh, basically, France had prepared for a war that is not going to be fought in this one because this is not World War One. this is World War II. Um, the body of water that separates Great Britain, the United Kingdom, on the map, okay, well, the yellow one, um, the island up there, from France, that is the English Channel. This is the same body of water on D-Day that we're going to cross when we invade at Normandy. So the, the G Germans plan is to chase the British and the French to that, to that coastline and trap them there, okay? That's the plan. Trap the, the French and the British with their backs against the coast there. It almost worked, but the Germans made a few tactical mistakes and ended up giving the British enough time to evacuate from the French port of Dunkirk. This is called the Miracle at Dunkirk. Um, they've made some, they've, they made a movie about it uh, a few years ago. It's not bad. Uh, it's a cool story. 338,000 escaped from Dunkirk to Britain with civilian boats, and I've got a picture of it on the right. Um, so civilians in, in the United Kingdom took their boats and sailed across the channel, put as many soldiers as they could on, sailed back, dumped them off, and kept making trips across the channel and back until they had evacuated 338,000 men. Um, that were about to be captured or killed by the Germans. While Winston Churchill and the British were incredibly proud of Dunkirk, Churchill was also quick to caution the British that wars are not won by evacuations. Although the British army escaped and lives were saved, the Germans still ended up taking uh, still ended up taking Paris. And Hitler, I may have mentioned this, I think I did, probably when we went over World War One. In World War One, the Germans were forced to surrender to the French in a railway car. Just, that's just where they signed the papers. Hitler heard about this when he was in the military hospital, and he is nothing if not dramatic. Hears about this, decides when he invades France, he's going to find the same railway car that the Germans had to surrender in. He plants it out in the woods, marches the French generals out there, and makes them surrender to him in the same railway car. Uh, I think he 
saw that as symbolic justice, I guess you could say. Um, France had fallen to Hitler in just 35 days, and now his attention is going to be on Britain. Churchill made it clear to both the British and the world that Britain would not seek appeasement with Hitler, and then he gives his, his famous speech here, um, his We Shall Never Surrender speech, uh, which you can go through and, and read that. They made a movie about uh, him as well, and he gives this, the actor, obviously, that's playing him, gives this speech in the movie. It's, it's good. Hitler's plan to invade Britain, Operation Sea Lion, depended on the German Luftwaffe, or the German Air Force, destroying the Royal Air Force, or the RAF. Um, the British Air Force was the best air force in the world, but the Luftwaffe was very good. Uh, in July of 1940, the Battle of Britain begins in the air over Britain and the English Channel. Extensive bombing campaign by the Germans. They targeted military targets as well as houses, factories, and churches. The RAF lost nearly a thousand planes in the fight, but the Luftwaffe lost more than 1,700. The British suffered heavy losses, but they held on, and it led Hitler, who sensed failure, to make a decision to suspend the bombing permanently. Honestly, if he had just held on a little bit longer, been willing to take some more losses, he potentially could have knocked at least the British Air Force out of the war, war if not Great Britain entirely out of the war. Churchill referred to the United States in many of his speeches, um, and he was similar to to FDR in that he used radio a lot, and, and FDR giving his little fireside chats over the radio. Churchill did, did the same thing. Um, so when I say speeches, some of them were, were over the radio to the British people. Now, he claimed that the Nazis were more than a European problem, but instead threatened freedom and democracy everywhere. And, Ch and Churchill, or sorry, FDR really agreed with Churchill. FDR had been prepared, I think, to get involved in war as early as 1937. But the United States was still kind of on the fence about it, obviously. We don't want to get involved in another major world war. We're still recovering, getting out of the Great Depression. Um, and we're not really directly implicated yet. Many Americans believe World War I had been a mistake to get involved, uh, and that the Great Depression was made even worse by getting involved in World War I. Congress passed something called the Neutrality Acts in 1935, 36, and 37 to ensure we didn't make those same quote-unquote mistakes again, which said we could not make loans or sell to countries currently at war. But Roosevelt's going to find a loophole to that. Once the war in Europe started, FDR felt the impact of the Neutrality Acts, and he wanted to help his allies. So the Neutrality Act of 1939 is passed, and it includes a loophole. This is called the Cash and Carry Provision for Nations at War, where the United States now could sell different things to nations at war as long as they paid cash for it, so they're not going to owe us money. And they carried whatever they bought from us back to country in their own ships, so we're not going to risk losing our own ships getting sunk uh, during war. Alright. Reports of what was happening in Europe, sp specifically Europe, uh, this should be specifically written, made many Americans believe that complete neutrality was not the right thing to do. These reports, many by CBS reporter Edward R. Murrow, led many Americans to at least believe the United States should be preparing to enter the war. So in September of 1940, in the fall of France, the signing of the Tripartite Pact by Germany, Italy, and Japan officially makes them allies and part of the Axis powers. This same month, Congress passed the Selective Service Act. This is a peacetime draft, and it provides military training to 1.2 million troops and 800,000 reserve troops each year. FDR gave Britain 50 World War one era battleships in exchange for Danish defense bases. He did not ask Congress to approve that before he did it. And he ran for and won his third term, third election as president, and it was not a close race. Um, FDR is actually going to be elected four times before it's all said and done. So we are getting closer and closer to getting involved, and we are preparing <clears throat> to get involved inevitably. FDR increased support of Britain once he was re-elected, comparing America's situation to a neighbor whose fellow neighbor's house was on fire. 
his, his example was you'd lend them a hose. You would not debate the issue or try to sell it to them. Uh, he said it also keeps the fire from spreading to your own house. So we shouldn't be trying to make money off the British or debating about what hose we should give them. We should just help them because we don't want the fire to come over here. In March 1941, Congress passed the Lend Lease Act, which authorized FDR to sell, transfer title to exchange, lend, lease, or otherwise dispose of any to any such government any defense article. This is just a bigger way for him to be able to give um, money and military, or not money, uh, but military things, right, to his allies. Uh, by 1945, the United States had sent more than $40 billion in lend-lease aid, lend -lease aid to the Allies. This is essentially an economic declaration of war, though, by the United States against the Axis powers. In 1941, Churchill and FDR meet secretly on a warship near the coast of Newfoundland. They discuss not only Britain's problems in the war, but also their hopes for the world after. And they also signed something called the Atlantic Charter. This is a document that endorsed... National self-determination, which is the right of people to elect their own officials and create their own government, and an international system of general security. So what they're saying is, after World War II is over, and the United States is inevitably going to get involved in it, the new world we create is going to be a world of democracy and national self-determination. A picture on the right is the signing... Um, of the Atlantic Charter and FDR meeting with, with Churchill. Hitler was not blind to the United States' support of the Allies or their presence in the waters around Iceland. Um, in the fall of 1941, Hitler ordered German U-boats, which are German submarines, to start attacking American ships. U-boats attacked the USS Greer, USS Kearney, and sank the USS Reuben James, killing more than 100 sailors. I say all this to say... Had Pearl Harbor not happened, we still would have been pulled into World War II, not just because we wanted to help our allies, but because Hitler was going to increase his attacks on American uh, American ships. So I will leave it there for Section 2. Um, in Section 3, we will get to... Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor and officially enter uh, the Second World War. So make sure you're keeping up with your work, doing your notes and your quizzes, and watching any videos that go along with this. And next time we will go over Section 3.